good morning and welcome to another edition of Better Business, Better Life. Um, I, today I am joined by Angela Poynton, who is the President and CEO of 11 Out of 11 Agency. And that's an agency who specialises in marketing for companies running on EOS. And Angela shared with me that she's actually a wee bit of an EOS fangirl as well. So looking forward to talking a little about that. But first of all, welcome to the show, Angela. Thank you so much, Deborah. Glad to be here. It's lovely to have you. Now, I always like my guests just to introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about your history. Like, how did you get to where you are now? So from when we've just been chatting, you've been going for about seven years uh, with the marketing agency, you've got about 20 staff in total. How did you even get to that point? Yeah, good question. So a little background on me. I went to school for photography, so not marketing. I decided through that experience in my degree to never make a living doing photography. It was just not something I could see myself doing. I thought that would suck the joy out of it for me. But what I did do during my degree was find out that I really love the intersection of creativity and marketing and business um, through some internships and working for companies and photographers that were soliciting advertising agencies. And so I decided marketing was where it was at and went back to school right away for my MBA in marketing. And then started with a job right out of that school, um, working in a marketing department for a fast growth startup company. From there, jumped to a marketing agency, uh, spent the bulk of my career working for another marketing agency before, like you said, deciding about roughly seven years ago to go out on my own and start my own. And so that's what I did here at 11 out of 11. And you're right. We primarily serve small to medium sized businesses in the States here. We do have some uh, international clients in Canada as well, but um, primarily in the States. And we love serving companies running on EOS. Why do we love serving companies running on EOS? Probably for obvious reasons for yourself and your listeners, but those organizations have, have shown or demonstrated by, you know, their adoption of that methodology that they want to organize themselves, get, you know, accountability in line, right people, right seats, and really get organized around goals and rocks, which as you can imagine, for a marketing agency is really important when you're aligning with a strategic partner like a marketing agency. You want to make sure that you're clear on what your goals are. Uh, they shouldn't be ch changing week by week. They should be very clear from the get go for both parties so that they know what the beacon is that we're working toward. And so that clarity is something that I appreciate and I think is is relatively rare in business, surprisingly. But pretty common within US run companies. Um, and so that's really been our niche for, I would say five out of the seven years, really focusing on working with visionaries and integrators that are running on US. I completely understand. I mean, I, I've, I've got a marketing background as well, actually. So I used to mm. um, work, in a, work in an agency and I ran an agency for a while as well. And nice. you're right. It's really difficult to work with clients when they're not clear about what success looks like, um, because then you really feel like you're shooting in the dark. You don't know what you're yeah. trying to actually achieve. And how do you celebrate success as well if you don't know what success looks like? Uh, and I guess you're right. EOS certainly gives that focus. And it keeps people focused for a period of time rather than flip-flopping as well, doesn't it? So you've got that 90-day sprint. You know that's what's going to be happening in the 90 days and um, real gives, really gives that clarity. For sure. Yeah. And I'm, I, you know, um, some individuals listening may be chuckling because that all sounds rosy, but realistically, we know that goals change, organizations change, and sometimes there are differing in opinions of what the goals are within organizations, right? And so mm -hmm. um, I don't mean to say that companies running on the US are perfect and companies working with us are perfect and we're perfect when working with the companies. Of course, there um, is always room for growth and improvement, but we do love that alignment from the get go. That clarity is really, really important. And sometimes companies come to us because they're not sure what the goals should be. They don't know what's achievable. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so we want to grow revenue by X. But as it boils down into marketing goals, you know, how does that translate? What's achievable within a quarter, a half a year, a whole year? And we help coach and advise on that topic as well. 
Perfect. Okay, so I'm going to ask a very basic question, and it's only because it's a little bit of a passion of mine. Mm -hmm. How would you describe marketing? What do you say marketing is? Well, I can't, there's global marketing in them. There's what 11 out of 11 does. So I will right. answer that in both. So marketing and, you know, branding, if you will, is more than just what people think of website logo messaging, right? It's uh, today become so much broader and involved than those basic elements. Those are considered table stakes in the marketing arena. Um, and we've become more sophisticated within, especially I'm gonna speak from my level of expertise, which is in B2B organizations. So businesses focus on selling to other businesses. There's so much um, to go in with nurture emails, you know, how do you automate some of your marketing? What's the user experience of somebody working with your company before they get involved? And then while they're a client, how do you market them to them continuously to keep them sticky or grow the account? Um, so there's quite a bit that we've all added to marketing and its capacity these days at 11 out of 11, we really thrive in that B2B world. And we really help companies focus on the content creation and automation of content generation. Meaning, you know, somebody comes to your website and fills out a form, they're not ready to buy yet, but they've shown some level of interest. How do we nurture those individuals through content to get them closer to the company, building trust and, and keeping top of mind so that when their pain becomes acute, they're ready to reach out to that company and not really think about any other competitors. Um, and so what are the marketing components that we need to build to help companies get there? That's really what we focus on is that level of thought leadership and expertise through content and also automation factors. As I mentioned, we work a lot within HubSpot on behalf of organizations, that particular tool in helping them develop, you know, automation campaigns, things to help build and lift the sales team. Thank you. That's really cool. Uh, the reason I actually ask is I think a lot of people tend to think of marketing as being advertising, as being the logo, as being, and it's, it's so much more than that. It's actually about the way that we actually nurture a customer mm -hmm. um, throughout the entire customer experience. That's my, my viewpoint. And I don't even believe it's a, it's a separate function per se. It actually should be absolutely integrated into everything that we do, putting that customer at the forefront and working through um, what that customer wants and needs. Obviously, um, online has changed so much about the way that we can do things. One of my little bugbears is a lot of this sort of automation, which is obviously not even tailored automation. It's just mm. that whole blast stuff out there with no consideration for the person at hand. HubSpot has got some amazing features that allow you to get very, very deep, deeply customized. So it's not mm -hmm. just a, a shotgun approach. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, I'll give two examples just to help people um, sink their teeth in. So. HubSpot offers something called smart content, and that's going to be primarily web-based. So if we think about what a user experience should be for a client coming onto a website versus somebody who's never worked with the business before, it's different, right? Different messaging, different experience, a existing customer might, might want information about add-ons, upsells, additional services, if you will. A new prospect is just trying to get to know the company and what it stands for and does, right? Um, what can I buy from this organization? Who are they? So two different types of visitors. If the contact is in HubSpot, and so therefore HubSpot knows because of a cookie that, hey, this is Deborah. She's a customer. Here's what should appear on this page for Deborah and customers like her versus Angela. She's a prospect content for Angela should be very introductory, trust building, credibility building, et cetera. It can display different contact, content, excuse me, in real time on a web page, depending on who the person is. Um, if somebody does not have a cookie, which listeners may be wondering, okay, what if it's somebody brand new that is not in the database? It'll just uh, present standard content, right? presumably prospect content, because you likely have all of your customers in your database. That's one example. Another example would be an email experience. 
So let's say I'm the prospect, you're the customer of this company, and we're both have downloaded something from their website. And so, you know, the company is nurturing us through uh, HubSpot. You click on one link in that email, I do not. So it might be an important link, like booking a call or some next mm -hmm. step with the organization, right? You're gonna buy more, I'm buying for the first time. And so the email behavior, once you click that link or don't, can be customized. You can get an email preparing you for the call because um, you've clicked the link, you've showed intent of having the call and then have that email convince you to book it. My content might be, hey, we love to talk with people. Here's how we're gonna help you. And it's trying more to convince me to book the call in the first place. So it can be tailored in that way. And there's tons of different trees and if then statements we could explore, but hopefully people get the idea of how that can be customized truly to really make it not feel like, oh, this is a robot sending me a one size fits all message. Yeah. And it also has the ability to kind of alert your sales teams too, doesn't it? When the person really has a, a huge interest. So you can then hand it over to a human being and a human being can actually take that to the next step. Yes. What you're talking yeah. about, um, HubSpot calls lead scoring. And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, every person, if you set it up or have an agency set it up for you, Every person has a point value that they're building based on their activity. So somebody who doesn't care about the company, isn't visiting the website, might have a point value of five or zero even. Um, but somebody who's really active <coughs> might, be, might be accumulating points and building their point value from there. And whenever the point value reaches a threshold, the sales team gets alerted of, you know, you should reach out to this prospect. Sorry about that barking. That was my dog. I'm actually working from home today because I've been a little That's bit good. ill. So um, he just said I did. it was a great time to have a bark. But yeah, okay, great. So it's giving you the ability to, I mean, it really is about helping stay top of mind with the customer. But then when they get to a point where they're really quite warm, you can then um, take some action outside of traditional kind of marketing, if you like. You got it. Okay, cool. So um, the, the que next question I have is around, you know, what size does your database have to be before you want to start thinking about some of these things? Because mm. I know some people think, oh, we've got to have thousands of people in the database to actually make it worthwhile. But that's not true, is it? It's not true. A lot of companies, if we think about B2B, you know, a customer for them might represent $100,000 a year, $50,000 a year, a million dollars a year, right? Mm -hmm. We're not talking yeah. about somebody purchasing a $5 product where you need thousands and thousands of customers in order to make significant revenue. That's more B2C. So on a B2B model, we're already typically talking about smaller numbers to begin with. Mm -hmm. And if anybody listening feels like, oh, my database is small or I haven't really paid attention to it, it's deficient, it takes a while to build some of this stuff. And therefore, if we're focused on getting ready to launch some of this automation and custom content, while the organization is really focused on building and cleaning up that database, that can be a beautiful pairing because it creates accountability for, we wanna get ready for this launch, right? And so if we think about a goal, let's add one hot prospect to the database a day. You got 365 by the end of the year that weren't in there before. And maybe that's too small. Maybe it needs to be five hot prospects a day. Whatever the case may be for the organization, that real focus puts a lot of intention on getting what we believe, and I think many marketers believe, is the most critical asset for any organization is its database, right? Mm -hmm. That's its opportunity to sell, right? And build relationships is within that database and far too many organizations don't take it as seriously as they should. The good ones really understand how precious that is. Um, but when focus is paid there, it will pay off. Even if we are starting small, um, because you're gonna be paying attention to it and building it through this work together. 
And I think you're absolutely right. I mean, for B2B, often customers are worth quite a large value. And so you don't need huge numbers of customers, but you do want to, I, I used to, in traditional marketing, I'd say top of mind was just making sure that when they finally get around to making the decision, you're on the, the list of choices that they actually um, you know, will choose from. Right. And so often it's easy to have a conversation with a potential client and not do anything with them. Um, and, you know, I've had clients who've gone away for two or three years and then come back and gone, hey, I'm ready to do EOS now. Yeah. It's like... I haven't heard from you in two years, but they've obviously yeah. been been um, consuming content, seeing what's going on. And, and so at the time when they're actually ready, you're there, you're in their mind, you're one of their considerations. And I think it's all too easy to let people drop off and not, not keep in contact with them. So even if you use a database for, you know, obviously the content generation and keeping them engaged, but also to, to remind you to be in contact with that person on a regular basis To I used to use it when I was um, I used to sell drugs, um, as in pharmaceutical drugs. <laughs> And I used to use my, my my CRM back in those days to keep track of things like, you know, what coffee the receptionist had. So when I turned up to the surgery, I'd bring the right coffee. I'd use it to note what their kids' names were, what their dogs' names were, what right. interests they had, and to remind myself just to keep in contact on a regular basis. So there's so much more than just online content that CRM is used for. Is that right? That's totally right. Yeah. I mean, the sky's the limit as far as what kind of custom properties you want to build. We've seen some crazy ones, but have you? Really, really... can you share some crazy ones? Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I can show that we used to collect when we brought on a new client. Um, speaking of dogs, we would, we we're pet lovers here. So we would ask people to put in their pets names and any, um, you know, was it a dog cat? What was it? And that really came from a client themselves because we used to have on the form to ask about children and, and one client put no kids, but really these are my kids and put their animals in there. And so it becomes just a fun topic of conversation. It's a way that, you know, after you sell something, the implementation team can carry something personal into their kickoff conversation and say, hey, how's Sparky doing? Tell us about him or whatever the case may be. So, yeah. um, but we've seen other ones that clients have used, right? Around birthdays, anniversaries, you know, smart things related to the business. Like client has told us that XYZ is a Q1 2025 goal, um, mm -hmm. just as far as reminders to the sales team to reach out, right? So there's all sorts of great uses for that kind of intel being stored. Sure. And so then what about um, AI? Does AI play a part in what's happening these days, you know, in terms of, um, in terms of CRM, in terms of the way that you communicate? How, how is it being used in the marketing world? Yeah. So HubSpot has used AI for a long time in very simple ways. Of course, just like any other tech organization, they are looking at use cases of ways to lean into it, to take things and make them even more advanced. Mm -hmm. As far as the marketing agency ourselves, we look at AI as a wonderful creative partner. And that's really today what it's good at. It's not quite good enough yet to you know, draft somebody's marketing plan for them or create a content calendar for them or create a really robust piece of content for them. But mm -hmm. if we want a brainstorming partner when we're staring at a blank cursor or we want to just get some ideas down on paper as a way to start something, it's awesome for that. It's an awesome creative buddy um, to be used in that way. But it's still, it desperately still needs human editorial and refinement before anything goes out into the world. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, I'm, I'm all for using it, but often it's just a great, it's a great thought starter. It's a great way to start with something. And I must admit that, you know, I put something into chat GPT as an example and what comes out, I kind of go, oh my goodness, I would never say it like that, but it gives me something yeah. to start with and I can, then yeah. I can actually reword it. And it makes you, yeah, it makes you think, at least get thinking about what you can do. Absolutely. Okay. Um, I, what are, people who are listening to this and sort of thinking, we don't really do much with our database at the moment. We're not really doing much in terms of nurturing clients. We don't have much in the way of what we have now described as being marketing. How would you say they can get started? What's the first kind of step they should take? So a couple of ways to think about getting started with any kind, of, even if you have a bunch of marketing, but you've neglected one area or you really want to focus on an area in this year, 
whatever the case may be, I always think it's good to create even just a draft plan. It could be a one pager, but getting some thoughts on paper. Um, EOS offers some tools for right strategic planning, so maybe some of those tools would be appropriate. But thinking through what possible next steps are, what are going to be the road blockers, what is going to help us be successful. Um, people who are quick starts don't want to do that work, and I get it. <laughs> Um, even I am not a quick start person. I don't score high there, but even I don't want to really work on that plan. But when I do, I'm always grateful. And so putting those thoughts on paper, one is going to create clarity for you on what the goals and roadblockers are going to be. And two, for any people you are working with, whether it's an agency, internal team members, new people you hire, it's going to create that clarity for vision for them as well. Um, and then really looking at right people, right seats, right? Who is going to help execute this? It's not the how, but the who. Um, who is going to be the, the right person to really bring this to fruition for you is a critical point that we all know as US believers, right? We know that if an idea doesn't have the right people with the right capacity assigned to it, it's going to struggle. Um, and so thinking through that initially. Um, I have written a book, you know, about this topic for people who are specifically looking for content and thought leadership. Uh, the name of the book, it's available on Amazon, is Stop Blending In. Um, so, it, you know, it tackles a particular facet of marketing, which is how do we as individuals and companies create a brand identity for ourselves and become known as the thought leaders for that, that particular thing? So that might be another useful tool for people who are looking to establish that. I love it. I'll have a look at that. I think you're absolutely right. The first we'll get really, really clear on what success really looks like. Um, and as you know, within the VTO, we talk about the, the, the core values and the core focus, but then also who is your absolute ideal target market mm -hmm. as well. I think one of the biggest things I always struggle with when I first start working with companies with EOS is that they, they kind of want to be everything to everybody. Um, and that makes it really hard because when you're trying to be everything to everybody, you're nothing to nobody. So yeah. getting really clear on what the ideal target client is and people go but, but but we can serve so many people but i think if you can get clear on the ideal you're not saying that you're going to say no to other people but it means you can really focus your effort and that that obviously improves the, the the marketing in terms of being really clear around what problem you're solving for that particular audience too yeah absolutely so true yeah Okay, so tell us a bit, but stop blending in. Tell me a little bit about where that idea to write the book came from and what it, what it covers in the book. Yes, so Stop Blending In was a passion project in 2019. It launched November of 2019, right before, of course, COVID. Um, the idea originally was to really speak on that topic. Um, that kind of got thrown into the chaos of, of the world becoming different. Um, yep. but it's still love and a passion of mine. So the, the book and the reason why I wrote the book is because for anybody else who's listening, who's written a book, you can probably relate to this. The idea behind we are in control. We own the control of what people know us for and what people know our companies for when we really think about it. And we have the ability to design that to be whatever we want it to be. So if you, Deborah, or anybody listening wanted to be the thought leader for X, Y, and Z, you're in the driver's seat of that. And it's just a matter of establishing yourself as that thought leadership um, position. And so the, the book goes through seven steps of how to get there, right? I want to be known for a weight loss thought leader or a thought leader in marketing, right? Um, whatever it might be um, for the people listening, whatever that area of expertise is that you want to stand out from the competition, it does walk you through, like, how do you identify that? How do you recognize what um, pillars you have to bolster you as that authority leader? Mm -hmm. So what intelligence and education and you know, your team and your team's intelligence, what do you have to lean on there? And then how do you get that out into the world? So 
what types of content are you creating? What sorts of marketing messages are you putting out there in order for people to start to identify you as that thing? The best at X, Y, Z, whatever that is for you. Um, that's what the book is about. You know, I really uh, feel incredibly passionate that it's not up to other people to identify that for you, which I think is what a lot of people believe. You know, our customers know our brand as being blah and putting the customers in the driver's seat or the audience in the driver's seat. It's really up to you as the company owner or the individual working at the organization to define that for yourself. Um, and so that was just kind of burning in me and needed to get out into the world. And so I hired a writing coach and we got it done and it was a super fun project. Um, and I love the book. It's got a lot of good teachings in it. Fantastic. So I think we're going to use that as a, we always ask for three top tips. That's tip number one, I would say. Start, awesome. Get hold of that book. So stop blending in. Um, seven steps in there about how you can become sort of a thought leader in your in your marketplace. And that's available from Amazon. What would the other two top things you would recommend to people that they could do after listening to this podcast? I would say, you know, uh, we know who our competitors are oftentimes. Oftentimes what we don't do a good job is evaluating them from a prospect's standpoint. Um, and so if, if anybody's kind of sitting here and, and thinking about marketing for themselves or for their company and they're thinking about, I don't really know where to, to start, there's no reason why you can't secret shop your competitors. Nobody in the world is going to arrest you for secret shopping your competitors. <laughs> Um, and it might feel like a strange thing to do, right? I'm pretending to be one of their prospects, but we can learn a lot by visiting their website, filling out their forms, giving them a call, acting like a prospect. We learn very quickly what that experience is and how to make ours better um, mm -hmm. and resonate for prospects who might be vetting them and us. So that's another just quick tip. Anybody can do it any day of the week. Uh, no one's going to come and put handcuffs on you for doing it. It's a great exploratory. Uh, um, and you could save yourself thousands of dollars of hiring market research firms who are just going to do that same thing for you. Um, no uh -huh. reason to do it, not do it yourself. And I think the last tip, and I'll, and I'll keep this marketing focus, is really, um, you know, looking at that brand for your website, looking at what that marketing and thought leadership platform is and trying to evaluate yourself on how well you are doing at getting across that you are the expert in that thing that you say you're the expert in. Is that hitting people over the head through the content on your website, email campaigns, social media, you know, how you show up at events and trade shows and networking. If it's not, you know, there's different ways to go about fixing that, but really understanding from the get-go where you're strong and where you need to do some improvement is a good way to start a new year. Fantastic. Hey, look, that's been really, really helpful. Um, I'm sure we could talk forever, but we've all got uh, lives to get on with. So um, just very quickly, tell us a little bit about, you know, who is your APSA ideal client? I know we've talked a little bit about, you know, obviously EOS, but they don't have to be EOS um, users. It's what does the ideal client look like for you? Yeah. So we love people running on EOS, but you're correct, Deborah. It can be similar operating system or that they're just learners, right? They're members of Vistage or other groups where they're trying to improve their company and their growth. I would say for us, it's a B2B company who is mm -hmm. small to medium size, right? In that kind of $2 million to $100 million revenue range, US dollar, I'm using here. Um, mm -hmm. We tend to work with people in the States, but we do have some international clients as well, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and definitely that B2B focus, that is going to be where we shine. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And how do they get in contact with you, Angela? Yeah. So What's the best way? I'm very active on LinkedIn. So if you want to learn different you know, marketing tips or read our blogs, connect with me on LinkedIn. It's just Angela Poynton. My web address is www.11outof11.com using the digits. So 11outof11.com. Nice. So that is fantastic. Hey, look, thank you so much. It's been really, really lovely to finally get to meet you. And you I'm sure we'll keep in contact. Um, I'm definitely going to get hold of that book. So stop blending in. You can get that from Amazon. And then also I've, I have um, just requested to follow you on LinkedIn. So I'm so looking forward awesome, to, to keeping in contact. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Deborah. Thanks for listening to the podcast show, Better Business, Better Life. My name is Deborah Chantry-Taylor. 
I'm an EOS implementer, family business advisor, business and leadership coach, podcaster, and speaker. However, I'm also a business owner with several current business interests. I'm fortunate to have lived the high life with all the lifestyle, the toys, you name it, and then I've lost it all, not only once, but twice in two spectacular train wrecks. I know what it's like to experience the highs and lows. I came across EOS when they launched into New Zealand using my Entrepreneur's Playground and Event Centre in Parnell, Auckland. I love the simplicity of the tools and their philosophies fitted my personal brand statement perfectly. The brilliance is in the simplicity. I've always been passionate about seeing entrepreneurs lead a life they love, and now I help them live that EOS life. Doing what they love, with people they love, making a huge difference in the world, being compensated appropriately, and with time to pursue other passions. If you want more information or want to get in contact about using EOS in your business, you can visit my website at debra.coach. That's www.debra.coach. Thanks for listening.